Uh, so, welcome everyone. Uh, the people who come here, I really, really appreciate anyone who comes here to watch my very first presentation at the uh, Open Source Conference. Uh, so, it's exciting. <laughs> Uh, this presentation isn't going to be quite that technical. It's very much aimed more at the community aspect of things, uh, of Metaverse, rather than the um, technical aspect of it. So hopefully it will be useful for a more general audience and also really interesting to the people uh, who are kind of coming at this from the outside, like seeing like, what are all these weird developers working on with Metaverse and such. Um, so I'm going to mention some online content creators in this presentation. Um, some of them may actually see this presentation because they are mentioned. Um, hello. <laughs> Sorry if I ever stole from your Minecraft house. Just send me a message on Discord, I'll give it back. Um, so quick, real quick about me before I get started. I'm mainly a software developer, uh, self -start, working on my self-started company. Um, Besides that, I've got a history in game development and game design. I'm also an artist. I also like to consider myself a maker, uh, as in laser cutting, 3D printing, that kind of stuff. And uh, right before I start my presentation, I want to give a quick uh, thanks to the Linux Foundation uh, for being really generous and making it possible for me to be here today. Um, it's not entirely certain I would be able to get to Vancouver without their help. I uh, also want a quick thanks to Roy O'Brien, whose support really has made it possible for me to be here today and get this presentation going and give him really, really good insight on the process of making it. And one final quick thanks to my teacher from college, Joost, <laughs> who's, without whose support I really wouldn't be here today either. Um, so, let's get started on the actual presentation. First slide, the critical question, every single Every single presentation of Metaverse has to start with this. Um, I gave a quick uh, introduction on who I am, but uh, first, first off, why should li you listen to me? I'm, most people probably don't know me. Uh, a few people watching this may, but uh, for other people, just why should you listen to me? Um, first warning, I am a millennial. Uh, which means that, uh, of course, I'm terminating online, uh, which means that I spend most of my time online talking to other people online. Uh, and I'm also currently destroying your favorite thing, uh, as all millennials like to do. Um, but I'm a software and game developer, uh, which means that in Metaverse I've got a bit of a background uh, on how the technical aspects of the metaverse work and how it ties together uh, from the game development perspective. Uh, and I think that's valuable because we've seen in game development a lot of valuable knowledge come in from VR games especially that we're not really seeing filtered through to the software development side of it. Um, and there's always been like a bit of a barrier between the two sides. And I'm also a VR early adopter. I have a, uh, a really old DevKit 1 Oculus Dev Kit 1 from all the way back, uh, sitting at home. Um, really like playing Team Fortress 2 with that. I don't think the newer VR headsets work with Team Fortress 2, but uh, haven't tried yet. And I have occasionally been in the right place at the right time. And that's for me, I think the most valuable part. I've had a very valuable opportunity to talk to the kind of people who are right now being affected by Metaverse the most and are basically seeing this happen in front of them and not always being happy with it. Um, and I hope in this presentation I can give a little bit of their voices heard when they don't feel comfortable themselves getting into our communities and talking about it. Um, also, I'm holding the microphone. Now, I did specifically ask for a lavalier mic, so I'm not literally holding a microphone. But I mean, if you're listening to this, well, there's not gonna be anyone else here in the room who you're gonna hear. Um, but yes, uh, the very first question for every presentation of Metaverse Legally has to start with, what is the Metaverse? Um, what's the deal with airline food of 2022 Tech Talks, essentially? Um, and really, this question is at the core of what this presentation is all about. Uh, because I think this is a more important question 
then a lot of people may realize, and we quite, kind of gloss over it sometimes, with saying like, well, everything can be in the metaverse. I th I'm not quite happy with that answer. Uh, in fact, a lot of people feel very frustrated with the answer, especially the people who we are telling uh, that the metaverse is going to be the future. If they then ask, like, well, what is the metaverse? And then we say to them, well, it's difficult to explain. Um, specifically, quite recently, a channel called Folding IDs uh, brought out a video about the central end called Futures Dead Mall. Um, from which I want to quote, despite numerous and numerous attempts, you probably feel no closer to having a workable definition in your head. Very few agree on anything other than the broad strokes. Almost all fall back on gesturing to Ready Player One and going, you know, that thing will be like that. Uh, one example, for example, is the book Snow Crash. Uh, the me word metaverse, of course, comes from the book Snow Crash, and famously quite a lot of words for software that we're very well known uh, with by now come from this book. For example, Google Earth, quite famously, uh, comes from uh, a concept in this book uh, called Earth, um, made by what, uh, what used to be the CIA in this book. Um, but when in presentations, when people say like, well, it will be like that book, uh, there is a thing that quite immediately comes up for most people, which is, of course, this is not a blueprint for how society should be. Uh, these are, quite frankly, dystopic books. They're supposed to tell us a cautionary tale of how things shouldn't be. A uh, quite famous tweet about, like, don't invent the term torment nexus. Uh, and I would say that quite a lot of people at this point are starting to feel like software developers, like they look at books and they think like, oh, cool, we should do that, and then don't really learn from, from the example. Because, well, in the end, these books do describe dystopias. And I think that not enough people in Metaverse right now actually read and understand these books. Uh, very specifically, Snow Crash is what we would call a hyper-capitalist dystopia. Uh, the United States in this book essentially doesn't exist anymore. It's being completely broken up into what they call franchise city-states, which are, um, well, some are run by companies, some are run by essentially the mafia, some are run by what used to be the United States military, and what remains of what they call the Feds is one small little part in the middle of San Francisco, uh, entirely walled off, uh, where millions of people go to work in the day um, before they go back to their uh, suburbs, suburbs of the state where they actually live. Uh, they've got no idea what they're working on. Uh, they're never allowed to be told more than a little bit. They, are, they have no assigned desk. Uh, they're all told in to come in at exactly the same time, but if you come in at that time, of course, you look down upon and you'll probably be fired. You're expected to show up before everyone else, and everyone is expected to show up before everyone else. Um, Snow Crash very specifically is also written in the background of the uh, nuclear, uh, the nuclear explosions um, happened during World War II. It is very much inspired by the idea of nuclear annihilation. Um, and definitely written, written in the wake of the Cold War. Um, two important characters, hero protagonist and Raven, both of their fathers were uh, prisoners in the Hiroshima uh, prisoner camps. Um, and quite notably, uh, Raven's father was blinded by the explosion that blew up Hiroshima. Um, and Raven, as a character, wants to come to America. Why? Well, to nuke America in revenge. Um, there is a lot of very bleak stuff in these books. It's not always a fun book to read, though Snow Crash specifically, quite a lot more fun, actually. I really do recommend it. It's a fun book to read. Um, but despite that, there are some sparks of excitement for me personally in these books. Uh, nowadays, the idea of metaverse is almost pedestrian to us, as described in the book, because it's so commonplace now. Uh, but if you read like the little details, for example, Hero, um, 
early on in the metaverse, when they wanted to get around, they had to code their own cars and they could do that. They could, like, by now, uh, at the time book is set as place, you have the choice to either code something yourself or buy it. But the coding part is still there. If you have the expertise, you can make whatever you want if you also have the money to buy a lot of land. Um, and as well, while people have heard of Earth in the terms of Google Earth, uh, my personal favorite from is actually the librarian, which is an AI assistant that while very notably repeating uh, that it has no capability to make um, any kind of opinions or inferences, uh, it does very frequently do that, which reminds me of currently upcoming technology. So there is, uh, there are aspects of it that I do think that we could emulate. There are rather, some pretty cool aspects in there. Um, but to bring it back to the question at the start, what is the metaverse? Well, um, I think myself, I would say, because I do think this question is important to kind of set what am I going to be talking about. Uh, I think that the most important part of metaverse is spatial interfaces. When we're looking at what can the metaverse do, it is a lot of physical picking stuff up, moving it around, being able to open it. Like you can do anything you want with objects, you don't have to explain how to pick up a book. People get it. Uh, when in game development, when we put people in VR systems, uh, people who have never played a game, you do not have to explain anything to them. They immediately get it. And that's like, imagine putting someone in CAD software, AutoCAD, like they're not, they just don't understand like what am I supposed to do? It's like, especially any kind of 3D software, it's just completely incomprehensible to most people, even though it could be extremely valuable for them. Uh, so there's such a huge opportunity there uh, to get more people tech literate, essentially. Um, as well, we're looking at real-time cooperative interfaces. Uh, historically, we've looked at um, these computer software as like a thing you uh, run on your own local system. Uh, but it's very important that um, with Metaverse, we're looking at multiple people using the same system at the same time, uh, which is a thing that we don't see enough of. And this is also really valuable because collaboration really is part of who we are as people. Um, this does bring in new challenges in UI UX. A lot of the things we've learned over the last 20, 40 years on how to make computer software just doesn't apply anymore because it works so differently. And uh, I think we, the idea of metaverse as a overarching word to describe things is very, very important for categorizing metaverse UIs. Um, and as well, in, with the idea of bringing it to the open metaverse, where we want to be able to get those programs, those metaverse programs, into different experiences. So you aren't locked into little silos. You can bring things with you, you can use it with other people. And it's very free flowing, like you don't feel like you're stuck and you have to like spend 10 minutes going into something else. Um, and of course, avatars, objects, decorative and functional. Uh, when you're putting your house together uh, in the metaverse, you want to bring those objects you found somewhere else, you want to bring them in, you want to have your own custom avatar. Uh, this all has to work together. It has to fit together, it has to be smooth. We don't want to get into a situation where people who just don't have the time to learn really technological terms have to learn about the difference between FBX and GLTF. It's just for them like that's, it's like, if you even start trying to explain it, they immediately feel like, well, I'm not, I don't have time for this. Um, and like I said, users just get it. And you don't have to, to explain how to pick up something or say you want to put something in a folder. Well, pick up the mouse, you have to press the red button. No, it, you just pick it up, put it there. You don't have to explain anything. People have been learning this from when they were very young and that's so extremely valuable. Um, so there are, a few, there are a few systems that we typically would call proto-metaverse or semi-metaverse or parts of the future metaverse. And the very obvious ones are things like uh, Minecraft. Uh, Minecraft, I think, for me personally, is the biggest example, just because it's one big world and you can, people can hop in, hop out, make their own stuff, and there's a little bit of game on top of there as well to keep things a bit 
more engaging than it would otherwise be. And there's this extensive modern community behind it as well. Um, and besides, that, what's called World of Warcraft is very often taken as an example because of it being this massive, uh, persistent connected together world, which I do think quite a lot of lessons we can take from World of Warcraft apply to Metaverse as we're building it now. And uh, another big example is VR chat. It's an incredibly popular virtual reality chat system. Um, supports on basically every single platform, just one of the biggest ones there is out there. And also notably, um, for content creators, really, really popular. Content creators love VR chat, despite that you often hear like that millennials and content creators hate metaverse, but they love VR chat. And we coming in to metaverse from our angle, like we think, but that is, that's basically what the metaverse is. Uh, so there's a question like there, uh, why doesn't this connect to them? Um, for me personally, like I mentioned, Minecraft feels the closest uh, because it's got this entire modding community, so you can build your own stuff and there's completely like uh, free to just jump in there and go build your own stuff. You don't have to be uh, technically skilled to really do that. Uh, VR chat, like you have to learn Unity to build your own worlds, for example. And uh, there's a lot more limitations for like an average user than it would be in Minecraft. Uh, but Minecraft does really lack that kind of systems interface. There is modding support on top of it, but it's not really well integrated. You have to be a bit technical to set it up if you want to do modding. Um, also, there's a lot of limitations on what you can actually do with any mods you make, which I think is a critical issue for Metaverse specifically. Um, because, especially for creators, there is the, what we call the creator economy. Uh, and this also relates to Minecraft uh, because we've got a lot of creators who basically make Minecraft content for their job. Um, this is a screenshot taken from a thumbnail by a channel called Rebel Ross uh, from a, a really big Minecraft server uh, called Bounce NCP. And they have just tons and tons of YouTubers working together, making this giant world and making videos about it and telling stories. Um, and behind this is an entire team of really, really skilled and talented people uh, that I do, just quick disclosure, I do happen to help out with now and then. Um, and they've put this in, in tons of work making this entire package of mods and different stuff and building this world together. Um, and that really enables these creators to do basically their job and it's required for them basically to do their job. And essentially like, um, behind Minecraft, there's this really complete, like very large ecosystem of modding loaders like the Quill Project and um, websites to host mods like uh, Modrint uh, over here. Uh, and they're the modders who are making these mods, like some of them legitimately earn their living from the mods they, they are making and publishing. They earn a cut of the advertiser profit that they get from the downloads. Um, so we're seeing this entire economy setting up behind Minecraft, which was never originally intended by this game. It's um, really uh, the lifeblood of the game as it is now in keeping it alive. Besides, um, of course, uh, the developers themselves have done an amazing job at keeping it constantly updated. Um, but for a lot of people, modern Minecraft is the only way they experience Minecraft anymore. Um, and for creators, there's this unseen creator ecosystem behind the scenes. Uh, infrastructure for video creators and streamers with software like uh, managing donations, managing apps, platforms for uh, content hosting, downloading. We've got services who are just dedicated to making little merchandise for these creators. Um, and there's this like of also less obvious, less direct, uh, like modders making mods specifically for creators. We've seen entire channels just focus on just making silly little modifications of games, just to like show to friends and make a video out of that. And it's really, really interesting. Um, and I really think that for Metaverse specifically, uh, those are the most interesting like groups of people we should focus at. Because in the end, like those are the content creators. They are the people who are going to make the actual content that populates the world. Um, 
but also bringing it back a step up again, the people making YouTube videos, those as well, um, they actually have been doing some of the things we're talking about in metaverse, like avatars. They've been doing that for years right now with something that came up in the last few years. The big elephant in the room, VTubers. I sure hope I'm not going to get banned from the open source convention track for talking about VTubers. Um, but yeah, these are people who in the last few years have made facial tracked avatars uh, to do live streaming content and video content with. So there's this entire industry behind them, uh, like people making avatars, people making little props for them. Uh, this tracking software links between the iPhone tracking stuff and bringing back the computer, uh, integrating it with streaming platforms, um, getting their avatars into games like Minecraft, uh, custom Minecraft skins or stuff like Beat Saber avatars, VR chat avatars. There's an entire industry around this of businesses, like real current businesses that are making content for games. And to me, this is what the metaverse is. It is people like using this collective virtual ecosystem to make stuff for each other and just have fun and make stuff and like find their own job in that. Um, it's very metaverse style content. Um, and next to that, uh, these VTubers, they are like an enormous community behind them. There are, uh, I think recently, a while ago, I think I saw we can like a hundred thousand listed VTubers. Um, but also, this is an enormous fan base behind them. Um, people here probably haven't heard of them much, uh, but if you, but they have set, like such uh, a large fan base behind them that on YouTube, for example, this is the top leaderboard of all time super chats on YouTube. Super chats are chat donations on uh, YouTube streaming. So if you see like the top, who gets the most donations of uh, super test on YouTube. Well, we're looking at the top five, top four. Uh, we've seen Rusha, Coco, P Pecora, and Marine. These are all VTubers. Uh, even more, these are all VTubers of the same VTuber agency. And if you look in the top ten, like uh, you're basically seeing like eight out of ten, if I recall correctly, are VTubers. Uh, so you've got this incredibly passionate community of streamers, but also of of fans who are willing to financially support their favorite creators in quite large amounts because, and this is something uh, some of the people here might have heard about a while ago, uh, when the VTuber uh, Ina had her birthday, uh, her fans organized a surprise for her that they had, that they rented out this billboard at Times Square for the entire day and just put fan art on there as a happy birthday gift to Ina. Um, and you would think that's like, what, it was very expensive. I'm, I'm one of the people who donated to that. It was lots of people ch chipping in to make this happen. And you would think like that's such an unprecedented thing, except that it happened twice. Uh, when Crony had her birthday, her fan base did the same thing uh, on a different billboard, because I think that one was at the time uh, under repairs, if I recall correctly. They couldn't get the same one. <laughs> Um, but we've got like this fan organized like community around this, making fan art, making content. Um, because the fans end up being the creators too. We talk very often about this dichotomy between uh, producer consumer, but in the end everyone is a creator and we've got this relationship, some, uh, symbiotic relationship between uh, the content creators and the fan creators. Um, because there's a lot of folk art. For example, uh, this is a character which has been revolt, referred to as Small Ame, which is a caricature of a feature uh, called Amelia. Uh, this was drawn by a specific uh, fan. Uh, and this became such a big part in the community that it eventually was adopted by the feature by herself uh, in merch and also in events. This is at an event related to that specific VTuber, they had a, um, just someone dressed up as that character. And that was originally a fan character, like not even at all associated with the agency that that feature was part of. Um, 
and we've got fan games, uh, quite complex fan games. Um, many, many fan games. Like if you look at that, you, you'll find just an absolutely huge amount of fa fan games. And just to repeat to me, like everyone here is a creator. You don't have this dichotomy between creator consumer. Everyone is a creator. And I think that's very important. Um, and repeating again, I really do think that both the creators and the fans are our biggest users. Because they're making this a really, really huge volume of just content, stuff for people to experience, sharing things with each other, they're making avatars, accessories, games, so much stuff. Um, and the biggest reason, though, to me, why they are our biggest users is because they're not pretending. They're not pretending to be anime characters. This is who they are to them. Uh, when they are streaming online, when they're talking to other people, they're not putting on an act. Those avatars are literally who they consider themselves to be. Um, you think Iron Mouse is acting? No, she's always like that. It's, I was really surprised by that. She actually is always like that. Um, a tagline from the Vishojo website. Vishojo is a big agency uh, that manages VTubers and supports them. Is uh, that filters help us to take the mask off and show our true self. And I think that that really is what Metaverse is all about, what Metaverse should be all about. Quickly noting from the top left to bottom right, that's uh, Porcelain Maid, Haruka, Apricot, um, Buff Pup, Battle Wolf, Arm, Mouse, Nyaners, Joe Cat, Kason, Nazana, and Centrea. Hope I got all their names right, otherwise I'm gonna hear about it on Twitter. <laughs> but yeah, they are living as their avatars, like this is who they are. Um, so, there is a bit of a conflict that happens there. Because these people, like, if you ask them about metaphors, they will tell you like they're very aware of metaphors and they really don't want it. They will like aggressively say like, no, I don't want to be associated with metaphors. It's career suicide for them, essentially, to be associated with metaphors. And they have like this very strong focus on individualism and they feel like metaverse is coming in and taking that away from them. Uh, to quote uh, a creator called Sarah Z, um, in a video she made, The Rise and Fall of Replica, um, the broader internet is increasingly becoming sanitized for advertisers in a genuinely dangerous way. Um, and this is one thing I always keep repeating. Uh, these people when they say they don't want metaphors, it's not because they are not informed on metaphors. They are extremely well informed on metaphors, but they have issues with it. They have issues with the way we are doing things. Uh, we're seeing this active pushback against uh, the corporate internet, essentially, in that they don't, they feel they're being harmed by this. And I think one really defining word of uh, this generation of creators, but also this generation millennials in general, is the word um, hell site. If you've talked to millennials, like almost everyone will have heard this site. Hell site doesn't refer to any specific website, it refers to whatever website you're currently on. Um, to quote again Sarah Z, the internet is not designed to be a place for users or creators but for advertisers. Sarah said it's actually learning Python, so if you happen to stumble upon this video, hello. Um, so we've got these people who are basically extremely, um, extremely technically skilled, not uninformed at all, so they know what's going on and they're saying like, well, we don't want this. Even though what we're looking at, we're basically doing the things that we want to do with metaphors, so what's going on here? Um, and I think the big thing is that there is an adversarial re relation at this point between the platforms and the creators. And they're seeing Metaverse come in as a continuation on this and tightening the chains that they feel they have on them already. Um, because the really, really important thing I feel is that money is not the goal. 
when these creators are making content, they are not making content to make a lot of money. They're making content because they want to create the content. But they do eventually, at some point, need the money. Because if you don't have the money, you can't make the content. You, you have to go do something else. Uh, creators need to eat. Uh, they care about create. They care about creating and sharing more, but they do have to eat. Um, and at some point, we just get to this point where there's this friction between the camps, where they really, really. I do think that these creators do really want metaverse, but that the well has just been poisoned. They feel like this is a continuation of the things they don't like. We've got, and all these creators, like if you talk to them about VR, they can talk to no end about how much they love VR and VR avatars and full body tracking. Like we've got uh, an entire community of VTubers who like if you offer them a full body VR tracking setup, they are going to absolutely love that. So all this metaverse tech is really, really applicable to them, but they feel like, well, we don't want Metaverse because it's been associated with all these things that we really, really, really don't want. Um, so one, one specific person I talked to on this, which I can't ever mention who it specifically was because uh, that kind of invites Lash back to them. Uh, but one specific thing that they told me was, uh, I told them about the Open Metaverse Foundation, like, hey, you can get invited, come, come take a look, come talk to us. But they said, it seems interesting. Uh, I think the word metaverse is kind of tarnished now. Uh, most creators try to keep a far away from it. I cut one specific part out of that just to keep the presentation going, not get on the sidetrack. Uh, <laughs> if you happen to see this, I'm sorry that I cut it out. Uh, we do talk about it more in the Open Metaverse Foundation, but just for the presentation, a bit to the side. Uh, but yeah, if you talk to them about Metaverse, like the one word that keeps coming back over and over and over and over is this topic. Because a lot of us who, haven't, who are working on Metaverse haven't read these books, uh, like Snow Crash, like Ready Player One. But you know who has read those books? Those creators. They absolutely have read Snow Crash. They absolutely have read Ready Player One. So they feel like people are just not learning from it. Uh, they feel like they are the more informed one here, and then we're coming in and telling them, well, you're not informed on this. Um, and they really just want people to listen. They want people to hear like which issues they're having. Uh, because in the end, we all do really want the same thing. We want what is supposedly going to be the next internet. We want it to be better. Um, just to bring Snow Crash back in, just quoting from chapter eight, uh, a quote from uh, uh, the protagonist of the book, Hero Protagonist. Yes, he's literally named protagonist. Um, he talks about the, uh, another character named uh, Juanita, who was critical to the making of the foundational technology of the metaverse in Snow Crash. And uh, what he, uh, he says is, um, once they got done counting their money, marketing the spin-offs, soaking up the adulation of others in the hacker community, they all came to the realization that what made this place a success was not the collision avoidance algorithms, it wasn't the bouncer daemons or any of that other stuff. It was Juanita's faces. Juanita made a system that did the facial tracking. Uh, to Juanita, what was important was the human interaction, being able to see people as people. But in Snow Crash, Juanita doesn't use the metaverse. Uh, another character notes it's like Alexander Graham Bell refusing to use the, the telephone. Uh, the reason Juanita doesn't use the metaverse is she feels it's become too commercialized, become too corporate, that it saps people's creativity, individuality. Uh, it's like a poison to the mind, essentially. Which, there's nothing wrong with the underlying technology there, but it's the way it's used. Um, so we kind of get to, now what? Because one common refrain as well that you'll hear from a lot of creators is like, well, averting dystopia. And then, like, there's a reason in the title of this presentation, the word averting is between brackets. Very commonly, they feel we already are in a dystopia. 
So at this point, it's like, well, we've got this opportunity to make a brand new start. So how do we learn from the mistakes from the past? Well, we need to build that bridge of communication for a big part. Uh, and one thing that I really feel with that is that we need to take the first step. Uh, because in the end, like, these people feel like they cannot talk to us. Uh, so we need to start by reaching out to them and saying, like, well, we are going to show with action that we are listening to these issues people are having. Uh, and I think a really big part of that for us is the idea of a duocracy. Uh, Royal frequently says to me, like, well, the Open Metaverse Foundation is a duocracy. Uh, and the way I see that myself is, is that it's not just like an organi organizational description. It is an emergent behavior of the way open source works. Because in the end, uh, open source communities, projects, things only happen if something does them, if someone does them. Uh, so if you want to improve things, you have to build the change you want to see. Uh, and the people who are really building things are the ones who make things happen. So in that thing of taking the first step, it really has to start with the people building these new systems that we are working on. Um, and a lot of that is going to be pulling of engineering work because um, in open source, one thing we do not have in open source is resources. Uh, we do have a fair amount of resources, but not nearly as much as the really, really, really large companies who are building massive platforms. Well, we don't have a lot of that, so we really have to work together. We have to pull resources. We have to work on things that work together, fit together, uh, so that we can build up the ecosystem um, to make the things we want to happen happen. Um, which means cooperation between projects and organizations. Um, one thing people have worried about with the Open Metaverse Foundation is, oh, there's another foundation coming in trying to decide what things are going to be like. But no, it's, um, it's a lot about looking at existing projects, existing what people are doing, and trying to see how can we fit that together, how can we integrate it, how can we link the tons of work that's being done in different places together into uh, what we want to see. And um, I do really want to stress on that. Like, I do think that the Open Metaverse Foundation and other initiative, initiatives like the Open Metaverse Initiative um, are a key component in making sure that we get where we want to be in improving the state of where things are right now. Um, and to some degree, we, have to, we do have to be realistic. Uh, we are... A big, at the start of my presentation, I said, like, well, people include almost everything in the idea of metaverse. Uh, but to some degree, we do have to be realistic. Some parts are more useful to be in virtual reality spaces than other things. Uh, so we have to kind of, like, find the barriers, like, where do we want to focus on? We can't do everything at the same time. Um, and when we focus on the very realistic core focus components, uh, we are... Uh, very quickly providing a lot more value to creators and to people. Uh, and one of the most important things, I think, is that this is a marathon and not a sprint. Um, interests for, uh, come and go, new cycles come and go. Uh, but in the end, um, for the people who are passionate about building Metaverse, uh, we have a lot of time to build the pieces a bit by bit. Uh, you just need to keep at it and build more little stuff over and over and over, a little bit of adding things together. Because we can't just sprint all together. We don't have the energy to do that. Uh, we go for a long distance, so it's a marathon, not a sprint. Finally, to close it off, um, I want to give a quote from Richard Feynman, famous scientist and bongo enthusiast. Uh, also noted for um, breaking into people's safes at the Manhattan Project. Not sure how he got away with that. Um, he, when the Trinity test happened, um, when the very first atomic explosion happened, essentially, um, afterwards he said, I'm about the only guy who actually looked at the damn thing, the first Trinity test. Everybody else had these dark classes. Uh, he, he was noted for, like, refusing the dark glasses that they were giving people uh, to protect their eyes. 
And I think that's very notable. We need to look at what we're building. We need to take off those rose-colored glasses where we're looking at very high-minded, idealistic ways at it. I do think that we need to be very realistic in the way we're looking at what we're building. And there it comes back to the question of what is the metaverse? Well, what do you want it to be? What do you want to build? Uh, and what are we going to make it be? Um, and finally, to leave it off uh, with one more cautionary tale, uh, a lot of people are talking about the metaverse with like, well, it's going to be, it's going to be uh, the future, it's going to be great, we're going to have computers do everything perfectly for us. And, um, well, at one certain point, people were saying uh, about specific nuclear reactors, they were saying like, well, it's going to be the future, it's going to be everywhere, it's going to be everything, and there's no way it can go wrong, because there's no way that an RBMK reactor could ever explode. I watched uh, the HBO series Chernobyl on the way here. I wanted to put that in. Uh, and there is absolutely no way that a medical radiometry device could ever give someone an overdose because it's protected by a computer and the computer doesn't make a mistake. At certain points, we have to listen to the people uh, lighting the alarm bells because all these things that have happened in the past, all the mistakes that have happened in the past, there were always people saying like, there's an issue here and we need to fix this issue. But in the end, what we heard back was what you did explain to me, how can an RBMK reactor melt down? And nobody listened to the alarm bells until it went disastrously wrong. So, leaving it off on that downer, how can you get involved? How can you make the change happen that we want to see? Uh, I really do think that uh, looking at the Open Metaverse Foundation is a good start. If you don't know where else to go, there are plenty of organizations and projects who are trying to make this change happen. Uh, and I think you should seek out your favorite one. But we at the Open Metaverse Foundation, we are trying to link a lot of different people together uh, to pool our resources. Uh, so I'm just for different groups of people who may want to be involved, if you're a developer, uh, well, there's plenty of uh, open source projects that are making different building blocks. Uh, we're trying to get more developers in the Open Metaverse Foundation to get started on building things and to start integrating different things together. I really highly recommend, if you are interested as a developer, uh, talk to the people there, talk to other developers, like see if we can like get things going, get projects going, get a roadmap going. Um, and if you are an asset creator, if you're a content creator currently making uh, 3D models, textures, all that kinds of stuff, um, I really would say like as well, like find groups to work together with, make like large environment kits, modular systems that non-technical people can start putting things together without needing to learn these currently really, really, really complicated softwares. Uh, right now and make a large volume of assets that s software developers can use to make their demos like look really, really good because like that visual aspect to a lot of people, that's the only thing they see. The visual aspect is important. Uh, they're not, most people aren't going to understand your really, really fancy compression algorithm. They're only going to be going to understand the really detailed environment you can get out of it. Um, and if you're a content creator, I highly recommend that you reach out. Uh, specifically, the Open Metaverse Foundation is entirely open to all non-technical people to come in and talk to us and give feedback and tell us what you need and what your current issues are. Uh, and really, like, in the idea of duocracy, and like I've said, it's more an emergent property. In the end, uh, that doesn't mean that if you're a content creator, you can't build your own code. It doesn't mean that you don't get a say. It just means that you need to come in and tell the people who are making the code what you really need. Because in the end, like the software developers know, communicating with clients is the only way you're going to get uh, the information to solve the problems those clients have. Um, and finally, if you are a business, um, I think there is a lot of opportunity here for businesses too to come in and provide services that uh, fit the needs of existing content creators that are feeling like, well, we can't. Uh, they feel very trapped in the current ecosystem. 
but there are a lot of smaller businesses and infrastructure that they are very, very happy with, um, uh, like donation infrastructure, content hosting, uh, merch providers, and sales and stores and uh, agencies to help them out. And there's so much opportunity there to help improve their lives. And uh, I think that is really valuable if you pay attention to that. And finally, if you are, um, one more thing I want to add on to this. If you are any of this group, but especially if you are a content creator, you can also talk individually to people. If you happen to know someone who is involved with development or stuff like this, if you happen to know someone who uh, is vocal about this stuff and is a developer, like you can talk to them directly, tell them your concerns. Um, because all the voices count. Uh, we only really know what people want if they come to us and tell us what they want. Um, and this presentation especially, it wouldn't have come with, without all the amazing feedback and conversations I've had with all the just amazing content creators who really built a foundation, really built a bedrock of what makes the internet good right now. And finally, leading up on that, I hope that this gives you some ideas on how we can avoid rebuilding the same dystopia that we've already built. Because we really do want to do better. I think most developers really do feel like we want to do better. And we've got this rare opportunity uh, to build something new and build something better.